you the quantum mechanics? Yes, we are the quantum mechanics, the paranormal podcast for the believers, the doubters and everybody in between. Thank you to everybody who's gone on our YouTube channel and subscribed. It isn't a cheap plug because we want to more subscribers. We're really a podcast, but we wanted to do something. We want to do something at Halloween, which includes a video feed, and you have to have a certain amount of subscribers. We'll find a way of doing it if not, but thank you to everyone who's done it. If you haven't done it, just go and click it. Don't need to do anything. It'll just mean that we can turn the live streams on in, uh, gosh, when is it? October. October. Yeah, thank you. There was some really nice... Um words as well because we did post it on facebook as well and lots of people came back said yeah done it love the podcast so thanks everybody's done it and commented we'll put another link to the youtube channel in the description of this episode so if you haven't done it and you fancy just doing us a favor that would be great thank you all the lovely comments certainly help it's uh it it just gives you a warm fuzzy glow as does everybody that goes to patreon.com forward slash tqm pod sign up help us out there that would be great we've got another field trip coming up next month haven't we yes, yes. we have next month for our regular what will the stones do stone uh, watch episode stone watch stone watch 24 stone watch 24 <laughs> uh we'll we've got a different idea for it this year we won't just be waiting for those same stones i don't think but yes <laughs> the most fun you can have watching three middle-aged men look at stones Sometimes there's more than those three middle-aged men. Sometimes we have up to five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> up to five middle-aged men. <laughs> the, the other thing I always, uh, that slightly uh, wigs me out but has made me smile is, do you remember when we did the Canuck Chase episode and James from the Lawmen was talking about Old Stinker and the werewolf? Yes, yes. And that uh, he has a... Old Stinker apparently has a Twitter account or an X account now and follows the lawmen. He's now following us. Old Stinker is following us, Ben. We're being followed by a werewolf. Yeah, being followed by a werewolf in a kind of social media way. Okay. What is the rule about that? Do you need to, like, have a silver button to block him how does it work yeah i don't know maybe i'm sure elon musk will kind of make a bit <laughs> make something up won't it there'll be a, a silver uh, emblem that you have to put on your uh, x page to block a werewolf maybe. well I, I, f- I feel very privileged that an actual cryptid has taken the time yeah yeah well maybe he encrypted it he encrypted us on youtube as well ah that would be good yes there. please do that i'll say that would be very kind well, let's get into the episode, shall we? I don't think I can segue easily from that. Put werewolves on Twitter <laughs> yeah. to whatever you're, <laughs> you're doing. Yeah, no. yeah, no, I can't. A couple of episodes ago, we did that story about when it might have rained extraterrestrial single-celled creatures in yes. India. Alien blood rain, basically. Alien blood rain. Now, a number of scientists, after analysing the weird red substance that rained down from the skies, put forward this theory that it could be extraterrestrial in origin... And they were heavily criticised by other scientists for even daring to suggest such a thing. And you said at the time, Ben, you mentioned Copernicus having been ridiculed for claiming the Earth revolved around the sun. Mm. Now, that statement and the episode you did last week on quantum explanations for some paranormal events got me thinking. Firstly... What other scientific discoveries have been ridiculed that turned out to be true, like Copernicus, whose works and writings were banned? Or even Galileo suffered probably a more severe punishment, being convicted of heresy and living out his life under house arrest for his scientific theories. I didn't know he was put under house arrest. Yeah, I I don't know how how bad a life that was for him. But yeah, I think, uh, like with Copernicus, he was kind of not allowed to write, and uh, was under permanent house arrest for the rest of his life. The fear of somebody's story being proved untrue. Yeah. Well, that's kind of what we're going to get into today. I thought we could look at some of the discoveries and scientific ideas that were mocked, ignored, or ridiculed that turned out, in the end, to be scientifically sound. I, I'm reminded of the, um, that fellow we covered who phoned Art Bell saying he'd invented a time machine and stole those transformers, if you remember. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, like he—he he was obviously ridiculed, but he's still—he's still alive. He's still working on stuff. <laughs> yeah, maybe he's the Galileo of our time. Maybe. Well, we'll come on to some of that thought later. But stories today are not primarily paranormal, but I want to feature them to see if there are any themes or learnings that could relate to the way that society reacts to stories and theories about the paranormal. These are not paranormal in nature. Some of them have got a little paranormal twist to them, 
but it's mainly about what can we learn is what I want to do today. That, I think that's that's fair because um, you know a lot of people do get ridiculed for their paranormal beliefs. Either way, you know, on either side of the fence. Yeah, we've always been pretty firm that um, no view is a bad view yeah. here, yeah. unless your name is Lee. But that's a completely different story. <laughs> yeah, but we'll, even if it's something that doesn't make sense, we'll explore it and pick it apart. But. I think the the key when we were thinking about doing the pod, podcast originally was we're not going to ridicule someone for their beliefs. We'll no. look into them, but we won't ridicule them. Exactly. Before we get on to uh, some of the other stories, I wanted to start with some amazing inventions that came about through pure accident. That sounds like the sort of um, the man that invents... I don't know, a particular recipe because he dropped three eggs or something. Yeah, exactly. Well, our first accidental invention is the microwave oven. Oh, really? Yes, which was inadvertently invented by engineer Percy Spencer towards the end of World War II. Now, Spencer was trying to create an energy source for radar. That was his mission. And he noticed when he used the equipment, it melted a chocolate bar in his pocket. (laughs) Oh, no, he was cooking himself. He was cooking himself. Oh, that's terrible. So then he wondered if the process could be used to cook food. One of his earliest tests of his accidental invention involved making popcorn, which we do today. Which we do today, yeah. See, this this reminds me very... A long time ago, in the 80s, when you had a car phone installed. Do you remember the little air wheel you used to have to have yep. glued or stuck onto the car? Yeah. It used to... When my dad first had one, it had a warning sticker on it that you had to remove and it said that you shouldn't stand within two metres whilst making a phone call really? because of the energy in the, in, in the, in the I guess, in the transmission. Yeah. And I remember my dad was like, oh, that's kind of like microwaves. And I remember sort of like, so dad, could we like impale a potato on the, uh, the, the aerial and cook it? And he was like, well, no, that won't work because it, it won't be enough. But it's the same kind of idea, that, that sort of... There was obviously a fear that people would be irradiating themselves and cooking themselves. Yeah. But, um, oh, that's, that's nuts. I feel like, did he live a long life or did he die? I don't know, actually. I didn't look into that bit of it. I don't know if it, it shortened his life, but there must have been something going on if he's using the equipment and it's melting chocolate bars in his pocket. Yeah, because the microwave itself is not a particularly complex device, is it? There's like the the emitter, and then there's a waveguide, and then it just all bounces around in the box and heats your dinner up. That's it. Yeah, I use it mainly to heat coffee because we have a pot of coffee on the go and some milk, and I'd use it for that. But I always, when I put my hand in to get the coffee out, I'm always a bit <laughs> even though it's stopped. There must be some residual waves, surely. <laughs> surely <laughs> thanks percy <laughs> thanks percy for that it's one of those things isn't it in 150 years time there'll be school kids learning about they did what they had a microwave oven in the kitchen yeah and they yeah. put their hand in it at the end oh my goodness <laughs> well the next accidental invention involves english pharmacist john walker This isn't whiskey-based. He wasn't a Johnny, he was a John. I'm sort of thinking crisps. Yeah, Oh, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Oh, it's not crisps. Not crisps either. In 1826, while experimenting with mixing different chemical substances, Walker managed to get a lump of the mixture he created stuck on the end of his mixing stick. (laughs) (laughs) That's not a euphemism. What are you doing this week? I'm mixing stuff. (laughs) What what can can a three-year-old say and a scientist say? (laughs) Right, okay. Now, when Walker tried to scratch it off, (laughs) it burst into flames. Ah, phosphorus. John Walker had accidentally invented the first strikeable match. Oh, excellent. (laughs) Wasn't his intention, he was just playing around. Gosh, I thought it would have been much earlier than that. No. Yeah. But can you imagine that, though? You just, oh, I've got this stuff stuck on the end of my thing. You go and rub it off and flame. Wow, wow, Okay. Another invention in 1942 involves Dr. Harry Coover, who was trying to create a lightweight, clear plastic substance that could be used to make gun sights. So I guess, yeah, that bit you look through would have been glass, would have broken in, you know, mm-hmm. in, the, in the foils of war. He wanted to create something that was light and durable. But all he managed to create was a big sticky mess and he abandoned his experiment. Nine years later, 
after thinking the sticky substance might be good for something, Coover experimented again with the mixture, inventing something he called Eastman 910. Hmm. You have a guess what it actually turned out to be? Perspex? No, it was later marketed as super glue. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, he was trying to create a gun sight and ended up creating super glue. And you remember all that? Do you remember when super glue first came out? There was all that. You're going to stick your eyelids together and there were stories of people having saucepans stuck onto the top of their head. Oh, yeah, it was very date. Well, yes. Oh, we were told it was very dangerous, but it was used, and still is used, to glue wounds together, isn't it? I, yeah, I think so. Maybe a ver- variation of it, yeah. I would have thought. Well, perhaps one of the most commercially successful accidental inventions was created by American pharmacist John Pemberton in 1866. Pemberton had been badly injured in the Civil War and developed a morphine dependency. The pharmacist was determined to create an opiate-free alternative to relieve his pain, but also that he wouldn't get addicted to. He created a drink that was a mixture of alcohol, coca leaves, which contain cocaine, and cola nuts. Coca-Cola. Well, he called his beverage French wine coca. (laughs) (laughs) French wine. (laughs) Now, unfortunately, after he launched the product... His health worsened, as did his morphine addiction. So his original purpose wasn't helped by this. Well, he did put coca leaves in the drink. I mean... Yeah, I guess he didn't think it was an opiate. I just put some of this yummy stuff in. What is it, nothing? It's just my (laughs) yummy stuff. Well, Pemberton sold his shares in the company to his business partner, Asa Griggs Candler. Now, the recipe was changed, and as was the name, from French wine coca to, as you said, Coca-Cola. Oh, this is so sad. Pemberton died penniless two years after inventing one of the most popular soft drink brands in the world. It's always the way, isn't it? So, What did Candler get out of it? Oh, I'm sure Candler did very well indeed. Probably the most successful brand in the world, or at least one of them. I would say so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he sold it off thinking, well, this, I've still got my addiction and this is useless, and yeah, went out, turned out to be Coca-Cola. So in those examples, Ben, when it comes to... Inventions. Necessity is not always the mother of invention. Sometimes it's just blind luck. Just getting sticky stuff on your stick. Yeah, rubbing it off. So a mixture of accidental discoveries there. Some proved successful and profitable for the inventor, but some, like Coca-Cola, didn't work out so well for its creator. But what about the frustration and mental anguish of scientists and innovators who truly believed their theories were sound only to be ridiculed by their peers. I want to start with one of my favourite examples of this and the work of German meteorologist and explorer Alfred Wegener. Wegener began developing the theory of continental drift in 1912. So put simply, after observing how the continents looked like they could, if squashed together, fit together like a jigsaw puzzle, and the geological similarities between the edges of the continents suggested to Wengener that they were once joined together. Pangea. Before we go deeper into his theory and the reception it received at the time, let's look a little into the life of Alfred Wengener, as it he seems like quite a character, Ben. So Wengener was born in Berlin, Germany, on November the 1st, 1880. He studied at the University of Heidelberg, Innsbruck and Berlin, earning a PhD degree in astronomy from the University of Berlin in 1905. He was an explorer, and to fulfil his desire to explore northern Greenland, he trained for many hours a day, walking, skating, mountain climbing and skiing in order to prepare for the expedition. He was, like, obsessed with training for this expedition. I, I got a measure of the man. He would have fitted in perfectly with the Sonora Aero Club, as he was an avid balloonist. Oh, OK. Once taking a record-breaking balloon trip with his brother, the flight lasted for 52 and a half hours, a record for the time. Blimey. That's amazing, isn't it? At my age, I can only think of one thing. Where you're going to pee? Well, and the rest. Yeah, exactly. You can't do that in a basket. No, we won't get into that. My mind is boggled. (laughs) It's a nice little segue. He even proposed to his wife in a balloon. <laughs> oh, that was actually quite a big thing in the Regency period. Quite a romantic gesture. Yeah, a romantic gesture, yeah. 
Well, he finally completed expedition to Greenland, where he studied polar air circulation between 1906 and 1908. On his return, he became a lecturer in astronomy and meteorology at the University of Marburg. He published a successful textbook called Thermodynamics of the Atmosphere before his second expedition to Greenland in 1912. Now, it was around this time of this second trip to Greenland that Wengener started to put together his theory of continental drift. He wrote, The first concept of continental drift first came to me as far back as 1910, when considering the map of the world under the direct impression produced by the congruence of the coastlines on either side of the Atlantic. At first, I didn't pay attention to the idea because I regarded it as improbable. In the fall of 1911, I came quite accidentally upon a synoptic report in which I learned for the first time of paleontological evidence for a former land bridge between Brazil and Africa. As a result, I undertook a curious examination of the relevant research in the fields of geology and paleontology, and this provided immediately such weighty collaboration that a conviction of the fundamental soundness of the idea took root in my mind. On the 6th of January 1912, I put forward the idea for the first time in, ad- in an address to the Geological Association in Frankfurt, entitled, it's one of those classic paper titles. <laughs> you ready for this? I'm ready. The geophysical basis for the evolution of large-scale features of the Earth's crusts, continents and oceans. That's one of my favourites. Could have been worse. Could have been worse. That's a good one, though. Now, Engler was not the first to explore the theory that the continents had once been connected. French scientist Antonio Schneider Pellegrini, studying plant... I like his water. (laughs) Yeah, he's very tasty. (laughs) Studying plant fossils in 1858, noticed that fossils from North America and Europe were identical and put forward a theory the two continents were once joined. So this is, what, 50, 60 years before Wengener? Right. But it goes back further than that. The earliest recorded mention of the idea of the continents drifting apart was by a Dutch cartographer, Abraham Ortelius, in 1596. Wow, Okay, That's very early. But he wasn't taken seriously as he was just a map maker and not a scientist. Yeah, but being a map maker, he was pretty close to what well, he got the ju- like. He got the jigsaw bit, right? Right, yeah. Even Francis Bacon, in 1620, commented on the similarity in shape between South America and Africa. I enjoy his sandwiches. Yeah. I had one this morning, I'm not <laughs> yeah. even kidding. A Francis sandwich. I had oh, a Francis, no, a bacon yeah. <laughs> sandwich. <laughs> it was a bat, but you know. But I like this about Wengener. He credited and referenced a number of those early pioneers in his paper and books about his theory of continental drift. So he didn't kind of try and pass it all off as his. He did refer back to all these people, which I think is really cool. Yeah. So he published a detailed theory for continental drift in a 94-page book in 1915 titled, he'd learnt about titles by then, The Origins of the Continents and Oceans. Oh, that's a bit more um, to the point. So what Wengener suggested was that all of the Earth's continents formed at one time in the distant past and was a single large landmass or supercontinent called Pangaea and a single ocean called Panthalassa, which had a, I don't know how he knows this, had a depth of about 2.6 kilometres or 1.64 miles and only left a small portion of the Earth's surface exposed. The various continents that we see today started to break away from Pangaea about 200 and 250 million years ago, this is what he claimed, and they'd been moving over the surface of the Earth ever since. So we kind of know today he was pretty much spot on with that, Mm, right? Yeah. Continental drift. Now, originally he didn't use the word continental drift, he called it continental displacement, but yes, it was later called continental drift. Now, he described what he wanted to achieve by publishing the theory. I wasn't going to put this little quote in because I've got lots of big and difficult words to say, but I think it is quite, <laughs> I think it's quite an important point. So let's have a go. He says, The book is addressed equally to geodesists, that's mathematics dealing with the shape of the earth, geophysicists, 
geolol- <laughs> geolol- <laughs> geologist. I don't know why I can't say that one. That's geologist. The, that's, that's, they're, that's, they're mean people. Yeah, yeah. I'm geolo- I'm saying you're a geologist. <laughs> I love you, my favourite uh, geologist. I love, I love geologist. Paleontologists, fossils, obviously. Zoo geographers, which I think are just zoo experts, zoological experts. <sighs> Phytogeographers, which is botany, and paleoclimatologists, climates from the past. Ah, oh, yes. That took me much longer than it should have. But the point is, and he goes on to say, its purpose is not only to provide research workers in these fields with an outline of the significance and usefulness of the drift theory as it applies to their own areas, but also mainly to orientate them with regard to the application and collaboration which the theory has found in areas other than their own. Which I like. He wanted the paper to be considered by people in different fields so they could work together and develop and review the theory. You see, that's exactly what... We've spoken about it before. This is why our particular area of interest is so hard, because... You know, UFOlogists don't really often work with cryptozoologists or people who are studying, I don't know, what, what, are, what are ghost studiers called? Phant- phantologists, something like that. Anyway, yeah. but the, because the field is not, there's not an obvious crossover point. So you get data points c- collected over sort of differing um, like areas of interest and expertise and knowledge and whatever. So, yeah, this this must have sort of given the scientific community, uh, you know, surety that this was an idea worth pursuing. Yeah. But like you said, I, then, as probably is the case now, people from different specialities rarely read papers outside their narrow field let alone collaborate with people outside their specific area of expertise. I think it was even more the case back then. Considering that paper that I had to come to terms with last week, I don't flip in blame. <laughs> yeah, you can get why. <laughs> and now, when you think about the concept of continental drift now, it's hard to believe that anyone doubted it, right? Yes, because you can actually see it. I don't know if you've been to Iceland. You can see the, yeah. co- the, you can see the, the fault line. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, should we have a look at what the conventional theory of the day was? So, oh, it'll be something crazy. It, uh, well, it it kind of is, but it... Burrowing hedgehogs. Y- oh, yeah, you've got it. Um, <laughs> it does kind of make sense, but, but, well, see what you think. The prevailing idea of the vast majority of geologists at Wengener's time was what the Earth was once molten, then the features we observe on Earth, for example, the mountain ranges, gorges, canyons, etc., were formed as the Earth cooled and contracted from that molten state. So they thought the peaks and valleys on Earth's surface were formed a bit like a wrinkled skin of a shrinking rotten animal. Oh, yeah, I get that. Uh, Sorry, rotten apple. Um, And as it shrunk, the low points were covered with water and the high points formed the continent. So it kind of shrunk and then the water came over certain bits of it, but it was still one big... Land mass, which do, it logically does make, sense, yeah. does make sense, doesn't it? Not yeah, true, you, but it does make sense. If you look at cooling lava, yes. you could get the idea, yeah. So then Wengler comes along, who's not a geologist, remember, and suggests a very different theory to the perceived wisdom of the day. Fair to say, Ben, the theory did not go down well. Two of the most influential scientists at the time were scathing in their criticism, the British scientist Philip Lake saying he is not seeking the truth, he is advocating a cause and is blind to every fact and argument that tells against it. Well, where have we heard that argument before? He goes on to say, it is easy to fit the pieces of a puzzle together if you distort their shape, but when you have done so, your success is no proof that you place them in their original position. It is not even proof that the pieces belong to the same puzzle or that all of the pieces are present. He was attempting a mic drop. There's more. American geologist R. Thomas Chamberlain, again one of the leading lights in the field at the time, wondered if geology could still be called a science if it is possible for such a theory as this to run wild. Mm. Later, in 1928, a symposium arranged by the American Association of Petroleum Geologists 
Chamberlain was to say, If we are to believe in Wengener's hypothesis, we must forget everything which has been learnt in the past 70 years and start all over again. That's people who don't want to believe they've wasted their careers. Yeah, and come up with something. Yeah. Yeah. Others described it as a fairy tale. Another described the theory as a very dangerous one and liable to lead to serious error. Why dangerous? Well, I think it's probably tying into some of those themes that the criticism is like, hold on a second, like you said, we've spent our whole life developing this theory. Here comes this guy who's not even a geologist who's telling us all that we've studied for the whole of our life is not right. But that's that first theory... Surely there's some gaping holes in it. Like, if you could find fossils in it, that means, like, if they were deep in the rock, surely sedimentary rock, they must have understood yeah. that that is different to volcanic rock, surely. Or maybe they didn't, because you don't get organic life forms buried in cooling lava of an ancient planet, do you? Dinosaurs wouldn't, bones wouldn't be there. I guess you could put forward an argument that as this kind of apple shrunk, this earth apple shrunk and the water filled in, that actually the fact that the two separated coastlines are geologically similar and have similar fossils is just because that whole area would have had all that plant life and geology. And so you can probably make a, an argument. It's like, yeah, that whole huge bit of it was, which is a bit of a coincidence, but yeah, I guess you believe what you believe. You could sort of backwards engineer a, 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 a credible reason, yeah. Well, it wasn't until the 1960s that Wengener's theory of continental drift was accepted by the scientific community. The 60s? Yeah, so he came up with this concept in, well, at least he published his book and came up with the concepts around 1912, but it wasn't until the 1960s that it was accepted. Good grief. Now, sadly for Wengener, he never knew, as he died 30 years earlier in 1930. That is terrible. He was celebrating his 50th birthday on another expedition to Greenland. He and his fellow explorers died on the return journey. I loved his collaborative thinking, Ben. You know, his wish to bring together the different scientists from different disciplines... I also like that he wasn't a geologist, just someone who'd used his, I guess, reasoning and intellect to put forward a theory. Though I imagine that contributed to the fact he was disbelieved and ridiculed, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Come on, how could somebody who is not an expert in this field tell us we are wrong? It is usually someone from outside, isn't it, in these cases? Yeah, yeah. Well, we're coming on to another one like that. Um, so, yeah, I'm sad that he never knew his theory was accepted by the, as scientific facts, but, you know, he was certainly influential. But it does show how entrenched, I, I'm not being ironic or making a joke, but how entrenched people can be in their scientific beliefs. Mm. So one thing I realised when researching this episode, Ben, was how many of these incredible talented minds were ridiculed at the time and they were a lot of them were what we might call characters or mavericks and our next example is no exception a man who not only put forward some influential theories but also to some degree embraced the paranormal interesting now he didn't put forward paranormal theories so you yeah i'll get on to it in okay, a second. okay his name you may have heard of him is tycho Rahi? I haven't. Now, I'm going to use a number of sources to tell his story, but we'll mainly focus on an article in World History Encyclopedia by Mark Cartwright, because it's really well written. Tycho Brahe was a Danish nobleman born in 1546. Before the age of the telescope, Tycho Brahe made some of the most significant contributions to our knowledge of astronomy. But he wasn't an astronomer. <laughs> He studied law at the University of Copenhagen, Okay. then continued his studies in Germany. This is nuts. While studying in Germany, Tycho got into a duel with a fellow student. He survived the duel. However, his nose was sliced off in the process. No. Yeah. For the rest of his life, Tycho wore an artificial nose. This is great. His everyday nose was made of brass, 
but he did have a nose made of silver, which he wore on special occasions. I was going to ask <laughs> if he had a dress nose. Yeah. Oh, my God. He had a dress nose. Now, Tycho became obsessed with astronomy on the 25th of August, 1560. I know that sounds quite specific, but it's after he observed a total eclipse. And from that moment on, his eyes were fixed on the heavens and the stars. <laughs> you were going to make a nose joke, weren't I you? I was going to make a nose joke, yes. <laughs> he just followed his nose. In the 1570s, he became the first to observe... How did he smell? Sorry, no. <laughs> <laughs> Awful, no. In the 1570s, he became the first to observe a supernova in the Cassiopeia constellation. God, we keep mentioning them. Yeah, Cassiopeia, they're back. This celestial event, this is amazing, this has only apparently only happened about, from my research, about five or six times in known history. The event was extremely bright in the sky and could be observed in daytime. So it was brighter than Venus. Good Lord. And he wrote a detailed study on the supernova in 1572. It was so influential, the supernova was then named Tycho's supernova. Nice to have a supernova named after you, I think. It is. It's one of the better celestial things. And interestingly, if you, I don't know if anyone has, but if you've got an X-ray telescope handy at home, you can still see the remnants of this supernova to this day. Wow, that's cool. In studying the supernova, Tycho developed some scientific theories that questioned the conventional wisdom of the day and eventually influenced the way we think about the universe. It's amazing stuff. He developed a measurement system that proved the stars were further away than the moon was from Earth. Sounds obvious, yeah, yeah. but back then. And he put forward a theory that the universe was a changing entity. I guess the early version of kind of expanding universe. And conventional wisdom at the time was the universe was perfect and was unchanging. A sort of um, deity-driven picture of the universe. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Now, even though most of the thinkers of the time disputed Tycho's theories, unlike uh, the last story we talked about, Tycho did have his supporters, or perhaps more accurately, his benefactors. In the shape of King Frederick II of Denmark and Norway who in 1576 gave Tycho his own island. Oh, that's so cool. So he could build his own observatory. And he was given generous funding from the Crown at the time. Very good. He had a huge budget and somebody, you know, the king said, have your own island, keep going. Nice one, Tycho. And boy, Ben, Tycho went to town building his observatory on his own island, which was called Uraniborg. Now I'm going to go back to the author, Mark Cartwright, because he does a good description of it the main building of Uraniborg was an extravagant structure bristling with platforms towers and spires a mix of fantasy that would not look out of place in arabian nights or xanadu so he's not sort of just going for a uh, utilitarian block then. no in fact if you do a little google search on tycho and his island there are some drawings of uh, the island and the structure that was built on it. It does look crazy. It, there's, I don't know why, but there's something about it reminded me of the Coral Castle. Maybe it's the eccentricity. Oh, right, yeah. It doesn't look like that, but you know what I mean. There was a workshop dedicated to the manufacture of scientific instruments, many of which were installed in other observatories. The site had its own paper mill and printing press to publish Tycho's research, there was also a laboratory down in the basement where Tycho indulged in his other great interest, alchemy. Ah, purest green. Which could explain the strange fact unearthed in 2016. According to researchers who analysed pieces of his hair, that traces of gold have been discovered in Tycho's hair in quantities up to 100 times higher than would be expected in a typical person. Oh... So I don't know if that means yeah, maybe he was, he was just getting it, somewhere. Yeah, well, that kind of does lead to that theory. His alchemy might be producing gold, or unless he was just experimenting with it and managed. But a hundred times is quite a lot. Mm. It's not just Tycho's interest in alchemy that straddled the paranormal. Tycho put forward the idea to the locals that he had magical powers. That sort of goes with the alchemy. Yes, it goes with that, well. and that rumor spread past the locals to others and it wasn't a rumor i don't know if he started it but it certainly wasn't one he dispelled 
this is crazy as well. Now, I've only found this in one article, so I'm a little wary. It wasn't the article that I mentioned earlier. But I did read one article that he built a number of automotive robots to convince people of his paranormal abilities. Oh, that is amazing. I've not seen them. There's no pictures that I can find. But his idea was he had these robots that were walking around the site, which just made everybody, you know, can you imagine back in those days in the 1600s? You'd be like, oh, my God. I want to know how they were powered. Yeah, yeah, I guess they were wind up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My God, that's such a crazy, brilliant idea. Yeah, it's really kind of crazy, isn't it? Now, if we return to Mark Cartwright's analysis of the impact he had on science, he says... Tycho's extensive observations allowed him to catalogue and position the stars and planets more accurately than had ever been done before. He shared this data with only a select few. He didn't want his rivals to present theories he himself was just formulating. Some data was released for public good. He took countless observations of the sun and recalculated the true length of the year a study that resulted in a wholesale change to the calendar to make it more accurate in 1582. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? He's he's overachieving right now. He really is. He completed a star catalogue, which positioned over 800 stars. Back in 1577, Tycho's detailed observation of the comet sighted that year showed that it moved in an orbit that passed between the planets. Further evidence of this phenomenon came with observations of the 1580 and the 1585 comets. This was to blow models of the universe which had everything moving around the Earth. The Greek natural philosopher Aristotle had claimed that comets were a phenomenon of Earth's atmosphere, but Tycho's research now disproved this long-held belief. Okay, he's a good guy. So these newly discovered facts and his previous work on the new supernova, clear evidence that there was change when Aristotle had claimed that the cosmos was internally stable, meant that the old Aristotelian views of the universe began to crumble. And he had robots. And he had robots. And a nose. Uh, Yeah, and he could make gold, apparently. Wow. For some historians, this was the true beginning of the scientific revolution, when observation began to test long-held and obviously incorrect theories. Sadly, like many before him, Tycho fell out of favour with the royals who were supporting him. Uh, In 1596, there was a new king of Denmark who wanted to take control of the royal purse, and I think there's also an implication he wanted to limit Tycho's influence. It was getting a bit too big for his boots. Yeah, I mean, he's just a smart ass at this point. Yeah, really. I mean... One of those annoying smart asses who's incredibly smart. Who's right, yeah, 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 exactly. And he's got a silver nose, so that's going to that's gonna make the king sort of on the back foot anyway, because he's, like, he's just got a silver nose. Yeah. Do you think he was the alchemy was trying to create a gold nose? Oh, maybe. Would do you reckon? If he'd done that, would his silver nose have become his everyday nose? You know what I would do is it, at lunch... I'd like pick my nose in front of the king and a diamond would come out. <laughs> yeah, that That's cool. what I'd do. And, and that would be just like the ultimate. Or keep switching them and see if anyone <gasps> notices. Yeah. That would be amazing. Yeah, I'd just have to powder my nose and literally come back with a completely different nose. Yeah. Well, he did find favour again with Rudolf II, who was the Holy Roman Emperor, and Tycho managed to give us one more gift to science. His assistant at the time was one Johannes Kepler, who went on to become one of the most important figures in science. Yes, and he lent his name to the satellite. Another thing that I think is interesting from these two stories is something we've just, we've touched on a little bit earlier. Like Wengener, who changed geology but was not a geologist, Tycho trained as a lawyer but changed cosmology. It requires different thinking sometimes. Yeah. There were a number of themes going through my mind before and during researching this episode, Ben. Firstly, that theme we've talked about on the podcast many times, that reluctance to explore paranormal topics from a scientific perspective. And we've talked about that. That's tied with ridicule, reputational risk. Can you get funding for that kind of thing? There's lots of The difficulty in collecting evidence. Yeah, there's a lot that goes around with it. The second thing that struck me with many of these influential scientists 
who changed conventional views, they were mavericks, right? I mean, that last mm. guy, like Tycho, you don't get more... That, there's the very definition of a maverick, right? A maverick eccentric with money from the, the king. I mean, Perfect. that's what you need, yeah. And I wonder if that kind of maverick part of them gives them the confidence or I guess some would call it arrogance to challenge the norm or not care about questioning perceived wisdom you've got to be quite strong right you do you do and also you've kind of you've got to be brainy enough to know what everyone else is talking about as well yeah and and bat off all those people who are coming at you yeah I get the impression that Tycho seemed pretty convinced of what he was doing and maybe didn't care that people were questioning him. I don't know why, it's not said anywhere, but I had the impression that for Wengler it might have been a bit harder with his continental drift theory, that you've got everyone just ridiculing you, saying it's dangerous, saying you don't know what you're doing. But that's the only way to argue against it. If you... It's sort of... This is the frustrating thing, is it's not a scientific argument. That is a emotional argument if somebody was to say ah yes but had you thought about this aspect of it how does that work with your model yeah. that would be a, a valid way of coming back but there's because they can see that it works they just have to go well it's just dangerous and i think that the Tycho story with his alchemy and his robots and putting forward this this uh, impression that he had somehow magical powers got me thinking about scientists who had a belief or at least an interest in paranormal topics. Should we have a look at some of them? Yes. I'm going to keep these pretty short. Now, I'm not saying they were right in their paranormal beliefs. In fact, some of them were fooled by people claiming to have paranormal abilities. Mm. I always feel really sorry for people like Conan Doyle, who, yeah. who did as well. Yeah, yeah, it's very much that. But it was very much of the time for a lot of these people, I think. It was, and there's that whole, like, the more we've got into this, we've sort of spoken about, there was this obvious conversation in, like, the gentlemen's clubs and betting and drinking and, the, the you know, the paranormal sort of goes hand in hand with that sometimes. I still, I've, I mention it once every six months, that bet where the guy had to spend the night in the tomb yes. with their dead friend and he died because he thought the hand had reached out to him whereas in fact he'd stuffed a fork through his own shirt yeah that sums up the whole thing the fact that you could scare yourself to death yeah actually it reminds me there's another thing i read about Tycho. he died in an almost ridiculous event like the one you're just talking about so yeah he was at a banquet and he really needed to go to the toilet but he was too embarrassed to get up and leave the banquet because he thought it would be rude. Ended up with him bursting his bladder, which he died from the complications of. Uh, I'm... What? Burst his own bladder? Yes. I was always told that's impossible. I thought that too, but that's, that's what it says. Oh, my God. I'm terrified now because the amount of times I'm like... Hey, I could go to this motorway services or go to the next one. Yeah, I thought that. And also, I mean, he probably was a man of a certain age at that point, but in the article I read, the banquet, it was only an hour. I've held on for much longer than an hour. I know. I guess it's how full your bladder is. Maybe he had some kind of underlying other medical conditions. Maybe it's connected with not having a nose. I don't know, but apparently... Maybe it's connected with not having a nose. I don't know how, but then we're open to new scientific ideas. But yes, he, that's how he died, which is kind of weird. Oh. Yes. I fear for my self now. So let's go back to the to other scientists who've got these kind of paranormal beliefs. And like I said, I'm not highlighting them because I think it means that they're amazing people who have cracked the paranormal... But I think what it does illustrate to me is an open mind, if sometimes misguided, but this desire to try and explain the unexplained, which is drive, I think drives a lot of scientists forward, right? Mm. So scientists that have a, had a belief in the paranormal, Marie Curie and Pierre Curie, pioneers of research into radioactivity, they regularly attended seances, some of which were hosted by Eusapia Palladino, who was later exposed as a fraudster. Mm -hmm. But they believed. 
Inventor Thomas Edison, who believed his communication technology may enable us to talk with the dead. Yes, I read something about that. He Wasn't he one of the proponents of the um, building a telephone for the dead? Yes, in 1920 he told a journalist that he was working on a spirit phone. Right, yeah, yeah. Although he did later... I don't know if this, because it kind of got some ridicule, he then said, no, it was just a joke, I was never working on it. Yeah, he was yeah. working on it. Uh, we have Alfred Russell Wallace, who independently published his theory of evolution and natural selection at roughly the same time as Charles Darwin did. He believed he had communicated with his deceased mother at sales. That's a fairly common belief in that time, to communicate with yeah. your mother, yeah. Uh, well, because again, that was Houdini. That was his big mission, mm, wasn't it, mm. to try and do that? There's one you'll like. Uh, let's move on to Oliver Lodge and Heinrich Hertz. Now, Oliver Lodge was a physics professor who had put former, forward a similar discovery as Henrik Hertz regarding radio waves. Lodge was a member of the Ghost Club and the president of the Society for Psychical Research. Wow, he was well into it. Yeah. When Lodge and Hertz met in 1890 to discuss their work on radio waves, Hertz revealed to Lodge that he too was interested in the paranormal, formed by a personal experience, but he didn't go into what that was. Uh, it goes back to my theory that everyone has one tail. Yeah, yeah. And when they met, of course, famously, when he shook hands, he sort of let out a yell, and he said, what's wrong? He said, it's just, it just hurts. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and then he left in his rental car. That was right. <laughs> and once again, that's the end of the show. No. <laughs> Sorry, I'm in a pun mood. That is that is amazing. I do like that idea of people who have that one thing because in that time you would carry it with you and kind of go, oh, I'm going to explore it. Um, yeah. People were much freer to look into their own ideas. Yeah. Well, it's not just the world of science. Influential psychoanalyst Carl Jung believed in ESP, something he would argue about with Sigmund Freud. So they, could, they had some wow. meaty debates about it. As did 1913 Nobel Prize winner physiologist Charles Richet, who studied anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock. He had a theory that humans could project their body forces to trigger physical events and have premonitions. He named it a sixth sense. Ah, OK. Now so he, he was the first person to use that phrase? Yeah, I believe so. He wrote widely on the theory. That I, I didn't go more into that, but I think he's someone we might come back to on the podcast because mm. he did do quite a lot of uh, writing on ESP and premonition, and that's something I'm quite obsessed with. So he, he may come up again. But yes, like I said, I'm not saying any of these great minds were correct about the paranormal, but they were clearly highly intelligent people who wanted to explore these subjects, right? And I don't know about you, but I just wish more scientists and modern thinkers explored paranormal topics to such a level, do you know what I mean, or with such passion. Yes, yes. I can really only think of, well, there are, uh, I guess, a few because there's a chair of uh, parapsychology at Edinburgh, I think. Yes. But there's there's Kieran O'Keefe who does um, excellent work, of course. But I do think I would imagine, and I I've only, I have met him once, but in a completely different context. I imagine if he goes to um, you know Oxford University and wants to speak to the physicists there, he's not going to get much time with them. Yeah, which is sad, and it's no, it, it it's just the status with which this. Uh, phenomena is given and people look down their golden noses at you well i and i i wonder this there is a lot of kind of psychology research into paranormal and paranormal beliefs but less so scientific research and I, i'm not saying that people uh, debunk's probably not the right word but from my perspective I wish people would work more together on it just to understand what people who've had paranormal encounters are experiencing. Mm, yes. Because we've said before, maybe it is all psychological, but maybe, like, we, the one that always sticks in my mind was the, uh, talking to Hertz, was that frequency, that audio frequency, which I think is 92 Hertz, which can trigger hallucinations in certain mm -hmm. circumstances 
and may explain certain paranormal sightings or experiences that kind of scientific research even if it's i'm not saying they should go out to prove the paranormal is a thing or that you know ghosts are dead people but just exploring it from that level not debunking but what's going on would be really interesting yeah it would yeah yeah definitely definitely and i think that's you know that's what people like tom DeLong are trying to do with um ufos but then I mean, as I said, they are connected, but there's a whole lot of politics there, isn't there? Yeah. And that kind of thought brings me back to why we called ourselves the quantum mechanics in the first place, you know what I mean? Not because we are experts or studied quantum mechanics. I think As w- some people thought at the beginning. Yes. I think it would be more accurate to say that we are n- naively quantum curious. Is yes, qu- very quantum curious, <laughs> yeah. yes, yes. Uh, but we named ourselves the quantum mechanics mainly because the kind of research and theories coming out of that field were just as fascinating and fantastic. And paranormal almost. Yeah, as many stories of the paranormal. And it's why I loved your episode last week, Ben, where that quantum mechanic connection was put forward by a scientist as an explanation for time slips. I was also struck researching this as how many of these maverick geniuses have had an interest in astronomy cosmology and i wondered whether looking at the enormity of the universe makes you more open to consider bigger and unconventional ideas i think it probably does because i i think when your brain is taken away from the mundanity of when the tesco's lorry is going to arrive and you start considering your small space in the universe yeah but from a really um informed point of view not just like a um a dreamy sort of notion about it but you get you get a real understanding of it i think it must change your 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 thinking dynamics it must yeah on everything i was thinking yeah. about what's his name neil degrassi tyson you know mm. where i've seen him talking about that he doesn't rule out that we are living in a simulated mm. universe now you know that that hasn't got anything directly related to his field but i wonder in in exploration of his field, it makes him more open to the exploring, at least, those ideas. I've got a conclusion. I know we rarely do them on the hey, podcast. Hey, OK. Well, it's a thought at the end. So to close this off, I wanted to return to the question of why so many scientists who put forward these theories that eventually become scientific facts were ridiculed and disbelieved by their peers and fellow scientists. And that started me thinking about the writings of Canadian philosopher Marshall McLuhan. I don't know if you come across Marshall McLuhan. No. He, he wrote extensively on the media. Um, and he had this concept that I've mentioned on the podcast before of the rearview mirror, he called it. Now, he was focusing on how the media views change and going forward and technology. But I think it can also apply in this wider context. McLuhan said... When faced with a totally new situation, we tend always to attach ourselves to the objects, to the flavour of the most recent past. We look at the present through a rearview mirror. We march backwards into the future. Moreover, McLuhan suggested, we cling to the rearview mirror because the view it offers may be more comforting than confronting what is visible through the windscreen. That's that's a very very interesting way of putting things, and yeah, that just sums it up, doesn't it? Really, I like it. And I think he related that. So he would say something like, "When the internet first launched, everybody was like, oh, we can read things,' <laughs> you know, because we were looking back through the rearview mirror of, oh yeah, we can read newspapers on a computer, you know. So no, it, it took a while for people to think." hold on a second, we can watch movies or... Yeah, I don't know if you remember when Netflix used to be a company that yeah. would post you... The DVD. A DVD, and then you'd post it back and you could get another one. The very last... I think it was called Love Films. Yes. But then the very last DVD was returned last year. Oh, really? They were still doing that service in parts of America wow. until last year, yeah. But if you think about it now, when Netflix first came out, it was just kind of acquiring stuff... You wouldn't believe now that it was one of the biggest movie producers in the world, no, would you? No. Sending out some physical physical DVDs to becoming one of the biggest studios in the world, um, and everybody watching it, ironically now back on their TV. You know, 
all the technology that enabled that together initially was about reading stuff. You know what I mean? So that's McLuhan's rearview mirror in action. But uh, I wonder if that is why these scientists who came up with these radical ideas, not just because they challenge conventional wisdom, but people were, wanted to look in that rearview mirror because it's more comforting. Yeah, it is. It is always more comforting. I do think perhaps the world is shifting a little to be more favourable to the topics we like to cover, but there's a long way to go. Long way to go. We'll keep looking through forward through the windscreen, shall we? Yes, mine's covered in flies <laughs> after coming over to you. It's very fly around here. Yeah. Well, we've had some mavericks, we've had some ideas. I know it wasn't purely paranormal, but I, I think there was a relevance in some ways. There absolutely is a relevance, and it all connects. Good. Yes, well, OK, I'll be back with my episode next week. Uh, we're going full uh, ghosts next week. Oh, I've been missing ghosts. I know, we're going full ghosts. And um, we'll see you on patreon.com forward slash TQM pod. We'll see you on the socials. Tell your friends, give us five stars if you think we're worth it, and we'll see you next week. Excellent. See you then. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. the quantum mechanics.